Okay, I know that we have some uh, younger people in the audience tonight. Some youth. No, I, I, no, no, shut your mouth. You're cute, but you're annoying. That's all I'm saying. No, no, I'm just being serious. But I know we have some younger folk here, and I thought that it would be appropriate to have a Bible song. Do you, okay, do you know what the Bible is? It's a, it's a, yes, it's a big book. And it's got stories and people in it and pages and maps. So I thought it would be great to do a Bible story about a Bible character from the Bible. <laughs> Hey there, Delilah, this is your ex-boyfriend, Samson. Inside voices. And I know you thought that lifting weights made me so buff and handsome, you were wrong. It's cause I let my hair grow long, that makes me strong. Hey there, Delilah, you came in while I was sleeping And I couldn't feel you cutting And I didn't hear you creeping out the door You left my hair piled on the floor While I just snored Oh, what you did to me oh, While I was asleep Oh, I'm a Nazarene oh, But you shaved me clean Delilah, you're so mean. I killed a lion, big and mean, and slaughtered many Philistines, all with a donkey's jawbone, that's no lie. But now I'm chained up to the wall, and I can't cry no tears at all, because they came and gouged out both my eyes. <laughs> this is a Bible story, boy. <laughs> I'm not making this up. <laughs> Why'd you grab your clipping shears and shave my head like Britney Spears? And now I'm standing here in total shame. You're to blame. People, that's stinking genius. What's wrong with you? Come on! Hey there, Delilah, why did you have to deceive me? And it's hard for me to think not long ago I wanted you to be my bride But you took too much off the sides <laughs> There we go Hey there, Delilah, when you die Just tell the devil I said hi He'll know why. <laughs> oh, it's what you did to me. Oh, now I'm up a creek. Oh, now I feel so weak. You know, I look like a freak. Delilah, you're a geek. Oh. Well, I bet you can't guess what we're going to be talking about for a few weeks. <laughs> Delilah and Samson, that's right. It's a very interesting story and a very interesting time in Israel's history. It's found in the book of Judges. 
which is near the beginning of your Bible. And the book of Judges is in between the time when Israel had kings. You remember in some of our messages we've talked about King David and King Saul and a whole bunch of other kings. And between them and when they had just been delivered out of the promised land, they had come all through the desert under Moses' leadership and then under Joshua's leadership, and then that was it. And then they were relied on on judges. And so judges would come and go based on what was happening in Israel's history and what the people were doing, whether they were following God or whether they weren't following God. And so it was a very unique time in Israel's history that we find the story of Samson. Before Samson comes as one of these judges, there's a bunch of other judges, Gideon and Deborah and some others. If you want to read through them, there's some very interesting stories of how God continually delivers his people and comes to their aid and comes to help them out. Well, they've fallen away from him. They fall into sin, bad patterns, bad habits, uh, hanging out with the nations that they're not supposed to, doing all these ungodly things, and then God turns them over to their enemies, and then they repent, and they cry out, and they're suffering, and God comes and delivers them. Now, Samson is a bit of a unique story from the other ones previous to this because Israel's actually not crying out to God, as we'll see in a minute when we read through the story. This is a time where Israel's kind of content They're under the the submission of the Philistines around them, and the Philistines raid them and do things, but generally speaking, their lives aren't horrible like they've been in the past, and they've just kind of learned to live with it. They've learned to live with the pain and the loss and the fact that they're being dominated by the Philistines, and so they're not crying out to God, yet God sees their state, sees what's going on, and God decides to act this time, which is unusual, because usually, again, in the previous judges before this, um, the people cry out, God, we, we need your help, we're enslaved, we're being you know, punished by these nations around us. But in this context, it doesn't happen. The people don't cry out to, to God. God decides to take action to deliver his people. And out of that context, he sends Samson. Now, most of us have, are familiar with the story of Samson, but you, if, you, if you're not familiar, we're going to read through it this morning. Um, if you were raised in Sunday school or church or kids ministry, this was the, the buff guy, the strong guy, the guy that could rip down walls and could do all kinds of crazy things because his magical power, his superhuman power, was that God gave him the strength that no other man had to do incredible things. The context of, well, how did that come to be and how did he get that strength was what will dominate a lot of the discussion over the next couple of weeks because it's the mystery, it's the secret, as we heard in the Delilah song. If you'd like to follow along, I'm going to read from Judges chapter 13 and we're going to start today with the birth of Samuel, or sorry, the birth of Samson and learn from that. Judges chapter 13 verses 1 and following says this, and I'm reading from the NIV. Again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, so the Lord delivered them into the hands of the Philistines for 40 years. And that's it. That's a statement. That's the context. So they're delivered into the hands of the Philistines. A certain man of Zorah named Manoah from the clan of Danites had a wife who was childless, unable to give birth. The angel of the Lord appeared to her and said, You are barren and childless, but you are going to become pregnant and give birth to a son. Isn't it interesting that many of the stories that we see in the, both the Old Testament and New Testament as, as we've just celebrated Christmas, God uses people that themselves are in pain or in struggle, that don't seem to have the things that other people in society have in this context. They don't have children. They don't have a son, which is a huge deal in their culture. You are barren and childless, but you are going to become pregnant and give birth to a son. Now see to it that you drink no wine or other fermented drink and that you eat nothing unclean. You will become pregnant and have a son whose head is never to be touched by a razor because the boy is a Nazarite, dedicated to God from the womb. He will take the lead in delivering Israel from the hands of the Philistines. Now let me just give you a a little quick context about this Nazarene stuff. So usually back in the book of Numbers, you could make a vow before God and you could um, shave your head and you could make a promise to God and you would have to keep that promise. There were other people that would actually grow their hair and, and, and not touch anything unclean and not drink any alcohol and for a set period of time, they would be this Nazarene. It would be taking a vow before God. But Samson is to have this from the day he is born. He is not going to have a razor touch his head, nothing unclean his mom's supposed to touch or 
Alcohol is she's supposed to drink while she has him in his womb, and he's supposed to raise Samson this way, to set him aside apart from everyone else. So verse 6, Then the woman went to her husband and told him, A man of God came to me. He looked like an angel of God, very awesome. I didn't ask him where he came from, and he didn't tell me his name. But he said to me, you will become pregnant and have a son. Now then, drink no wine or other fermented drink and do not eat anything unclean because the boy will be a Nazarite of God from the womb until the day of his death. Then Manoah prayed to the Lord, pardon your servant, Lord. I beg you to let the man of God you sent to us come again to teach us how to bring up the boy who is to be born. Interesting. God heard Manoah, and the angel of God came to him again to the woman while she was out in the field, but her husband Manoah was not with her. The woman hurried to tell her husband, He's here, the man who approached me the other day. Manoah got up and followed his wife. When he came to the man, he said, Are you the man who talked to my wife? I am, he said. So Manoah asked him, Where, When will your words be fulfilled? What will be the rule that governs the boy's life and work? The angel of the Lord answered, Your wife must do all that I have told her. She must not eat anything that comes from the grapevine, nor drink any wine or other fermented drink, nor eat anything unclean. She must do everything I have commanded her. Manoah said to the angel of the Lord, We would like you to stay until we prepare a young goat for you and food. The angel of the Lord replied, Even though you detain me, I will not eat any of your food, but if you prepare a burnt offering, offer it to the Lord. Manoah did not realize that it was the angel of the Lord. Then Manoah inquired of the angel of the Lord, what is your name so that we may honor you when your word comes true? So he still doesn't get it, who this person is, or who it really is. He replied, why do you ask my name? It is beyond your understanding. Then Manoah took a young goat together with the grain offering and sacrificed it on a rock to the Lord. And the Lord did an amazing thing while Manoah and his wife watched. As the flame blazed up from the altar toward heaven, the angel of the Lord ascended into the flame. <laughs> Seeing this, Manoah and his wife fell with their faces to the ground. When the angel of the Lord did not show himself again to Manoah and his wife, Manoah realized that it was the angel of the Lord. We are doomed to die, he said to his wife. We have seen God. But his wife answered, if the Lord had meant to kill us, he would have not accepted a burnt offering and grain offering from our hands, nor shown us all these things or now told us this. The woman gave birth to a boy and named him Samson. He grew and the Lord blessed him and the spirit of the Lord began to stir in him while he was in Manahah, Dan, between Zorah and Esther. So this is the beginning story of this little boy, this baby that has a miraculous birth of two men, a man and a woman, who are unable to conceive up to this point, God intervenes, God takes the initiative, and all the plurality and the apathy of Israel's society at this point, because they're not crying out to God, God decides to send Samson to deliver and to help his people. Now, it's an interesting story, and we can see lots of parallels here to some of the other stories that we've read in the Bible. And so the question might be, well, what does this mean to us today? Well, if we look at the story of Samson over the next couple of weeks, there's going to be some really easy principles we can pull out. But when we talk about this birth of Samson, what's going on here, what does this mean for you? What does it mean for me thousands and thousands of years later? Well, here's just a couple of thoughts for us this morning as we think about this. And I think this is important to recognize for a number of reasons, but I think primarily because for many of us today, particularly if you're watching online and, and this is all new to you, you're checking out spirituality for the first time, you don't really have a relationship with God or Jesus yet, you don't know all this stuff, and you might be looking at the world around you and you might be asking yourself, well, where on earth is God? Like, honestly, with COVID going on and now we've got Kabbalistan or how you pronounce that country that just had all those riots this week and now Russia's at the border of Ukraine threatening to invade supposedly or maybe not, who knows. The United States, you've got China, you've got Iran. You've got, I mean, there's so many things going on in this world. You might look and go, is God like crazy in control? Like what's going on? And what this story does for me anyways is it illustrates and it demonstrates that God is active in history. That he is involved even when you can't see it. Now remember, this is the birth of Samson we're talking about today. So it's going to take quite a few years before Samson is old enough to do the things that we're going to read about in the next couple of weeks. The miraculous signs and the taking over the Philistines and all the crazy stuff that goes on. It's going to take, you know, 15, 20 years before Samson grows up to be the person that God has called him to be. 
But throughout that period, Israel still exists and history is still going on. And I'm sure people probably at that point were wondering, God, are you really in control? Do you really care about us? Like the Philistines are dominating us? There were probably people that were asking that very question, just like there are many people today asking that very question. And I think that as we read through this story, that it demonstrates and shows us that God is active in history. And what does that mean? What are the principles when we talk about this? I remember when we were in Bible college, we took a history course on history of Christianity, and the, the, the professor's definition of history was his story, which I thought was kind of cute. Because the reality is, is, despite what we see in the world around us, everything that we see that's going on is God's story. And that's hard sometimes when we see difficult things. Or we see activities that happen that we don't understand, or tsunamis, or natural disasters. Those are very, very tough conversations to have. But it's all part of God's story and his purpose and his plan for everything that goes on. So here's a couple of thoughts as we think about God's activity in history and our response and how we reflect on that. And the first thing that goes on here, or the first principle that I love, is that God uses average people. You don't have to be a superstar. You don't have to be a billionaire. You don't have to be an Alan Musk. You don't have to be, you know, a Moses or any of these people later on when they became the popular people. God always starts with people who are just average. Actually, quite frankly, sometimes they're even below average the way that the rest of the people look at them. Because in Israel's thought, if you didn't have children, children were a blessing from God and a sign of God's blessing on your life. And so if you didn't have children, some people would be wondering, well, what did you do wrong? What's wrong in your life that God hasn't blessed you with children? And so sometimes God doesn't just use average people. God uses people that are even below the average from what everybody else thinks because they think there's something wrong with you. And this is a pattern throughout the whole Bible that God uses average to below average people from our perspective when he decides to move in history, when he decides to do something. It's incredible. See, godliness is not measured by what you have. In this context, it was children. Godliness is not measured by what anybody else around you measures. Godliness is measured by what God thinks about you. And in a modern context with a relationship with Jesus Christ, it depends on our relationship with Jesus. These people were obviously godly. They, they were going to do exactly as we see what God called them to do and asked them to do to raise this Samson, to raise this boy. God uses average people to follow him, to do his will, to be obedient. I was reading an article that they've come up with this new luggage. It's a luggage, and it's actually developed in Israel. It's a, a, a collapsible bag that has a collapsible handle, and then you put it on the ground, and guess what? It actually can follow you around. It's got little wheels and a motor inside of it, and a little eyepiece so that it can actually identify who you are, and so that you will never lose your luggage again. It actually follows you. It's a pet, except for it's a luggage bag developed in Israel by NUA Robotics. And they're hoping to expand this technology and do all kinds of amazing, incredible things with it. Why? <laughs> so that you don't lose your luggage. So that you have something that always will follow you, that will always be by your side when you're traveling. Well, the amazing thing about God is we don't need a luggage. We don't have to worry about anything breaking down. But that's what God's looking for us, in us is a people who understand that it doesn't matter who we are and what the rest of the people around us think about us. The only thing that matters is what God thinks about us and what God calls us to do. And then because of that, we follow him to the very ends of the earth, no matter what it is. It's not based on what you have or what we own or what other people think about us. It's based on our relationship and our value that's found in God. You know, probably the greatest example, the antithesis of this is King Solomon. King Solomon, he's the guy later on in the Bible, the fourth king of Israel, Solomon David, the third king of Israel. And he's been given this blessing. He gets to choose one thing that he's allowed to have. It's like a genie in a bottle. And he tells God, I want wisdom. And so God says, well, because you've chosen wisdom to rule my people and not money and not wealth and not women and not anything else, you get it all. 
And so Solomon is one of the most supreme rulers that Israel king ever had. Wealth beyond measure. You read through in first, Second Kings, the, the wealth and chronicles that was coming into Jerusalem. It was insane how much gold. and I mean, it was, it, they had so much bronze and silver that they didn't even count it anymore. But at the end of his life, he writes this book called Ecclesiastes. You ever read through the book? It's a very depressing book. <laughs> it's a very interesting book. But it tells us at one point that Solomon, who has everything, he has 900 concubines and hundreds of wives and all the wealth and prosperity and palaces and dominion over all kinds of seas, and he's got everything. And what's his conclusion? Life is meaningless. Like, really? And the reality is, is that life is meaningless when you're not in God's will and you're not walking in relationship with him and living a godly life. And somehow, Solomon, with all of his wives, he started worshiping other gods, and it just, it was a mess near the end of his life, unfortunately. God uses average people to move and to transform history. People that are willing to be obedient. People that are willing to do whatever it is that God asks them to do. Secondly, God intervenes when society is lost. And I love that because that gives me hope for our society today. Because as I look at our society today, I go, whoa, we are so lost. We are so mixed up. We are so damaged. We are so broken. And God sees it. God's not ignoring it. Just like he did with these, the, the, these is, the Israel at this point, knowing that in their apathy, that they got no power, they just didn't even care anymore. They weren't crying out to God. They weren't asking for deliverance, but God knows that they're in trouble, so he decides to act. He decides to intervene. That gives me hope. Now, that means for us, though, as a church, we should cry out to God. For those of us that know that we're so far from God and we're doing things and making decisions that, that aren't honoring God or honoring his word, we can cry out. We can ask God to move. We can ask God to intervene. But at the end of the day, it's God that will make his choice to intervene into our society. These people that were apathetic, like our culture, these people that were probably indulging in sexuality and pluralistic gods and all kinds of other cultures around them, which God had said, stay away, don't touch. They'll drag you away from me. They didn't listen. And God is going to use Samson, as we're going to see in the next couple of weeks, to bring his people back to the reality and to bring his people back to godliness and to demonstrate his power and his dominion over everything. You see, God is still in control. I love Job chapter 38. The book of Job is, is the story of Job where Satan gets to test Job. And Job goes through all these horrendous experiences where he loses wealth, he loses family, he loses power, he loses his health. And then he finally gets his audience with God. He's had an audience with some friends of his that give him all bad advice or basic advice is, you know, you've done something wrong, Job, so fess up, and when you fess up, then everything will be good again. And Job says, no, I haven't done anything wrong. I haven't done anything wrong. And so there's back and forth and back and forth. And then finally, Job gets an audience with God. And I love God's response in Job chapter 38, verses 2 to 18. Listen to what God says. Who is this that obscures my plans with words without knowledge? Brace yourself like a man and I will question you and you shall answer me. Where were you when I laid the earth's foundations? Tell me if you understand. Who marked off its dimensions? Surely you know. Who stretched a measuring line across it? On what words footing set? Or who laid its cornerstone while the morning stars sang together and all the angels shouted for joy? Who shut up the seas behind the doors when it burst forth from the womb when I made the clouds? its garment and wrapped it in thick darkness when I fixed the limits for it and set its doors and bars in place when I said this far you may come and no further here is where your proud waves halt have you ever given orders to the morning or shown the dawn 
upon its place that it may take the earth by edges or shake the wicked out of it. The earth takes shape like a clay under a seal. Its features stand out like those of a garment. The wicked are denied their light and their upraised arm is broken. Have you journeyed to the springs of the sea or walked in the recesses of the deep? Have the gates of death been shown to you? Have you seen the gates of the deepest darkness? Have you comprehended the vast expanses of the earth? Tell me if you know all this. What is the way to the abode of the light? And where does the darkness reside? Can you take them to their places? Do you know the path to their dwellings? Surely you know, for you were already born. You have lived so many years. And on and on it goes. It's a polite rebuke to Job. When Job says, you know, why is this happening? Like, tell me. And God shows and demonstrates to him that even when you don't understand, even when you can't see what's going on around you, that God is in control. He uses ordinary people and he intervenes when he knows we need help. Wow. What an amazing God. He's not distant. He's not disconnected. But he's here with us. He desires to look after us. He, as we sang this morning, he is a good father. And a good father is one that wants to spend time, who wants to invest in his children, who wants to love his children despite what choices they make often. He's a father that despite our earthly fathers who have disconnected with us or maybe we've had bad experiences, God is the perfect father. He's the father of Jesus. He's your father. We've been called his adopted children, his sons and his daughters. Because he loves us. Because he loves you. And that love isn't dependent on what we've done. That love isn't dependent on what we have. That love is not dependent on our skills or our talents or our resources. That love is given freely. No matter what your status in life is, God chose these two people to bear a child that would deliver his people. And for us today, God chooses to allow us to hear his voice. He chooses to reveal himself to us through our friends, through our families, through his word, through church, through the scriptures. So that we can have this relationship with him. So that we can be the people that he uses to change history. And to be a part of something that's bigger and more grand than us. Manoah and his wife didn't know where this was going to go. They didn't see down the line what Samson was going to do. They just saw the moment and saw God intervening into their life and heard this promise that this baby was going to be unique and special, that God was setting him aside and setting him apart. They didn't get the full picture, and most of the time we don't get the full picture. But they knew that God cared. They knew that God was intervening into history. So here's a couple questions for you and for me as we go from this place this week. If God uses ordinary people, are you willing to be used by God? Whatever that looks like, and it's going to be different for each one of us, given our context, our situation, our circumstance, our skill sets, our resources. How can God use my life? How can he use me? And maybe you're not ordinary. Maybe you're extraordinary. Or maybe you're not average. Maybe you're below average. It doesn't matter. When we're obedient to God and we pour out our hearts to him and we build this relationship with them, it doesn't matter. He'll use whatever we've got. And sometimes he'll give us things that we don't even have now to use for his kingdom. They didn't have a child. God gave them one to use for his kingdom. If God is in control of society and history and his story, who's in control of your life? Are you willing to surrender your life and ask God, God, what is it that you want me to do with my life? No matter what stage we're in. As you spend time praying and listening to God's voice, can you honestly say, God, you have total control of my life and everything? 
You know, if we could answer these two questions with affirmatives, if we are being used by God, and if God is in control of our life, then God will make this church, this place, this city, this country an unstoppable force for his kingdom, and history can be changed, and people's lives can be changed. The lives of our children, our grandchildren, our relatives, our communities, our schools, and even, yes, our nation. It takes miracles, it takes time, but God is in control and he is active in history. The question is, are we willing to be used by God and are we willing to let God be in control of our life? Let's pray. Jesus, we are so grateful that you loved us so much that as we've just celebrated Christmas in a very similar story with the birth of your son, Jesus, with the birth of John the Baptist through Elizabeth, and now as we go back into the Old Testament, the birth of Samson. We thank you, God, that you are a good father. We thank you that you are involved in history, that you are part of history. We thank you that this is your story. Father, in our lives, we want to pour out our hearts and our lives to you and be accessible to you. If you've never had the opportunity to be used by God and sharing your faith or praying for somebody or using your talents or your gifts or whatever it is, and just allow God to use you this week. God, every day as we get up, give us opportunities to be used by you to let your story be written not just in our hearts but in the hearts and the lives of those around us. May you intervene in our stories and in our lives, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.